Now I'm recording. Here we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Arner's Orientation for Fall 2022. We have our act together now. Um, my name is Dr. Marchetti. I'm the director of the Honors Program. I see a lot of folks here who I know. I see some folks whose names I don't know yet. And so I'm happy to get to know you all um, as you become more involved in the program. I'll get my participant window up here. Okay. So today's honors orientation is good for you if you are um have been a member for a while, but if you're new, I'm hoping that you'll learn a lot of things that will help you be a successful honors student. So first, we're going to talk about the leadership of the honors program. I've already said my name, April Marchetti. I am the director of the honors program. I'm kind of in a weird position. I am a chemistry professor, um, but I don't teach chemistry courses very frequently anymore. I am the chair of the education program as well now. So um, I teach the occasional education course, the very occasional honors course, I mean, not honors course, the very occasional chemistry course, and I direct the honors program. Um, our administrative services coordinator is Sabrina Granderson. You can see her on the right, right here. Um, her office is in the president's office. So if you go into the president's office, the person who you see at that very front desk, yeah, I don't know how often you all go in there, probably not very much, that is Sabrina. So Sabrina helps me monitor our email. She will communicate with you. Sometimes some of you who didn't receive your honors focus books, you've communicated with Sabrina and she sent you your honors focus books through the mail. Um, you'll see her at our events as well. She also organizes lots and lots of things for me, which is very, very helpful. The honors office is in Andrews Hall 111. For those of you who are first year students and who are living in Andrews Hall, you've probably seen me there by now. I've seen lots of you walk by. If you've not been in Andrews Hall before, if you don't live there, you go in the front door, go to your left, and you'll see my office there in the lobby. This semester, I don't know if I put this on a slide. This semester, my office hours are 7 a.m. to noon, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Meaning I'm usually in the office at that time between seven and noon. At noon, I switch over to my other office in the education department. Um, Wednesdays, sometimes I work from home on Wednesdays, sometimes I'll work from the honors office, sometimes I work in education, that's more of a flexible day for me. Um, the phone number for the honors office is right here, 412-1435, and then um, honors at rmc.edu is the email address that you would use for the program. I prefer if you're going to correspond with the program, you, you use that one instead of my amarquette at rmc.edu email address, only because that way it keeps the different things that I do separate. Also, a lot of times people will send an email to me and at amarquette at rmc.edu and to honors at the same time. That just confuses me and sometimes I'll respond to you twice. So anything you need, you can email honors at rmc.edu. I monitor that email box and Sabrina monitors that email box. We're the only two that can look at it. Okay, here is a picture of the honors office, um, if you haven't seen it. And you can feel free to stop by if you see the doors open and say hello to me. I put candy outside the door today. I saw a lot of people stopping by to pick up candy. I have a lot of Pop Rocks left over. Um, so feel free to feel free to stop by to pick up candy, but also if you have any questions, you can always stop by. If you do not have time to make an appointment or to to meet with me when the office is open, you can make an appointment with me using the link that you see on your screen. Now you don't need to write this link down because every time you get an email from me, it, this is in the signature of the email. So I use a service called You Can Book Me. It's a booking service that will allow you to make an appointment at any time that I am free on my calendar. So it's linked to my calendar. So if you click on that link, it'll show you my avail availability for the next a long time, like six months. And you can make an appointment with me via that link. So anytime you get an email from me, Anytime you get an email from honors at rmc.edu, it's in the signature, so you can see it there. 
okay, how will I communicate with you on behalf of the honors program? There are four ways that I communicate with honors students. The first and the most frequent is emails from the email address honors at rmc.edu. You should have gotten an email from me and I'm guessing that you all did because you're all here um, letting you know about this event. <coughs> I try not to send too, too many emails to you because I know you all are inundated, but please read the emails from honors at rmc.edu. Sometimes at least skim them because sometimes they're very important. So I will communicate with you from that official email address. The second way I communicate is via social media. You are not required to follow us on social media or be on social media, but every event that we have in honors, I will send you an email to let you know that it's coming up, but I also post them on our Facebook page and on our Instagram. Those are the only two social media that I'm doing right now. So if you follow us, you will see that I put our announcements up there. A lot of, I know you all are on Facebook. A lot of your parents follow honors on Facebook. And so they see what our events are there. Um, I know a lot of you are probably on Instagram, so you can follow us. We're honors at, we're on our RMC honors on both of those platforms. Okay. Occasionally, I will send items to your campus mailbox or to your home address. Um, for example, today, they, the college should have put the honors yearly schedule, which we'll see at the end of this presentation, into your campus mailbox. We labeled them all today. Sabrina had them. She was going to give them to campus, to the mailroom, and they were going to put them into your mailboxes. So please, I know a lot of you don't check your mailboxes very frequently. Please go to your mailbox and get that piece of paper. That's that poster that I emailed to you that has all of our events for the fall. Um, I will do that once in the fall and once in the spring. Other than that, I'm not gonna put a lot of like advertisements in your mailbox because I know people aren't going to their mailbox a whole lot. However, when we do the honors probation and warning periods, which happen in January and in June, those letters, our physical letters, our requirements say that I have to produce a physical letter. So in January, you will get a letter in your mailbox letting you know what your standing is in the honors program. Every single person gets one. I will email you all and let you know when those go in your mailbox. Please pick them up. Last year, I got like 20 of them back because students didn't check their email, for, I mean, their mail for the whole year. Um, so pick them up. <coughs> The last way I will communicate to you only happens usually once per year, and that's items mailed to your home address. If you are a continuing honor student, and there are a lot of you here, um, you should have gotten a letter mailed to your home address over the summer with your honor standing information in it. The only times we don't mail to the home address is for international students because sometimes those letters do not reach their destination. Actually, a lot of times um, those letters do not reach their destination. And so we've started just emailing those to the international students. But because they're confidential, the rest of them go through mail. So please keep in mind that those are the ways that I'm gonna communicate with you. If you're really bad at email, try to check your email from time to time because I do communicate with you regularly, usually at least once a week from the honors email address. Okay, um, next thing we're gonna do, if I can get the slide to advance, is look at the honors website. So I'm gonna stop sharing here for, oops, just one second. And then I'll share again a different slide. Okay, PowerPoint. PowerPoint, stop. Oh my gosh, PowerPoint is just not being good with me in show. Here we go. Okay, I'm gonna share something different. Share screen and share Safari. Okay, so the other place where you can get information about the honors program is our website. And let me show you how you get to our website. So this is the Randolph-Macon website. 
uh, I honestly just get to it by typing in honors into the search bar. It's the first thing. Well, honors program, there it is. Okay, here we go. So um, I've updated this website. I actually updated it some today. I try to keep it up to date so that it has current information on it. Um, this part is not pertinent to you because you're already in the honors program, but our application cycle starts at the end of this month. There's a video here that you can watch if you wanna see some of our current honors students. There's a video that we made during COVID, just kind of a neat video. And then there's just a bunch of information. Um, that you may have looked at when you were a prospective student. Maybe you did not, but you're welcome to look at that. The part that I want to um, point out to you is this on the left-hand side that says information for current honors students. If you click on that, you get to this website and everything that you need, almost everything that you need, is here on this page. So here are the requirements to graduate with honors, which we'll talk about in a second in more detail. And then below that are documents that are important that you might want to look up. So the honors handbook is here, the 2021-22 handbook. I will update it at some point soon. Um, our probation policy is posted on our website. Information about your e-portfolio is, uh, is posted. And then the due dates for spring 22, which I'll update to spring 23 when we get closer to spring 23. So you can take a look at these documents anytime you want. Um, if you have questions, please ask me, but this is a good place to start. We used to pass out a copy of the honors handbook to every honors student. It was a lot of paper <laughs> and we just didn't wanna use that much paper. So this year we're just gonna keep it on the website and you'll be able to access it there. So that is something that you will want to see. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And then we'll talk about the benefits of being in the honors program. This is the last time I will unshare and reshare. So don't worry. Okay, play from current shy slide. There we go. Okay, so we'll quickly talk about the benefits of the honors program. You probably are aware of most of these benefits. Um, we do get some library privileges as members of the program. The library is doing a professional development for us. Um, I think it's in October, at the beginning of October. They're going to talk to you a little bit about what, what those benefits are. I know one of them is that you can take out different types of interlibrary loans than non-honor students, which means you can take out more expensive library loans, but you can also take um, out longer in our library loans. You essentially have faculty privileges. Um, there are some other benefits, like there's um, a place in the library where you can leave your books if you don't wanna carry them back and forth um, to the library. But then we also have specialized honors professional developments that the librarians are gonna come and deliver to us this year, which is pretty cool because the, the first one is gonna give you some general information about the library. But the second one is gonna be about research. And as you all progress through the program, you all tend to do a lot of research. So um, they're gonna tell you about ways to make your, e your research easier and ways to find references more quickly um, and how to request those references, things like that. In addition to that, we get some priority access to EDGE services. The EDGE opens up um, registration for certain events to honors programs or to, uh, to the honors program early. In addition, we get some edge only professional developments, edge only, honors only professional developments every year uh, as well. We have a little bit of money to provide conference travel and research presentation funding. Now, this money, I don't normally know how much of it we're going to have until a little bit later than now, honestly, because we don't have our budgets yet for this year. The grants are quite small, they're $250 each. Um, but once I get information about that, I will send out an email to everybody letting you know how much that conference travel presentation money will be. Um, you all know that you have the ability to register for honors classes. Those honors classes all fulfill a collegiate requirement and they're smaller in size than a typical class. There's 16 people you know that we have professional development workshops because you're at one now. And then we have lots of events scheduled every semester. The end of this presentation, I will show you the schedule of all of the events for the fall. 
Last but not least, um, you can live in honors housing for all years if you want. Uh, we have um, the Andrews Honors LLC and the second floor of that wing of Andrews, which are reserved for honors students. They do not house every honors student in Andrews. As you know, not everyone gets in. They do that by deposit date to the college. But we also have the Honors LLC in Conrad for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Mostly sophomores and juniors live there because seniors often want to live in the apartments or they want to live in the townhouses, but we do have a lot of juniors and seniors that live on the second floor of Conrad in an honors only floor that we work to improve um, on a regular basis. So if you are a student at this professional development who lives in the honors um, LLC, you will be hearing from us soon because we bought you all some new chairs for your dorm rooms. And um, we're also working on some stuff that's happening in the study room as well. Okay, <laughs> in addition to that, every time we have kind of a big visitor to our campus, which usually happens once or twice a year, normally I get a block of tickets reserved for the honors program at the event. And then there's also a private reception with that visitor that will happen um, before the event. So last year, if you were here with us, the gentleman from Hamilton was here and I was able to get a block. Actually, they just opened the whole block to honor students like a day before everybody else got to register for that event. And then I think I had 10 or 15 spots at his reception. So that's kind of a cool thing. You get to meet famous people. <coughs> so look for those emails to come for me when they happen. I do not know who the big visitor is going to be this year yet. I don't think they've picked the person as far as I've heard, but I already know we're getting tickets, so that's good. And then finally, if you complete the honors program, when you graduate from Randolph-Macon, you will have honors listed on your diploma and on your transcript. So the diploma, you've probably, if you've listened to me talk about honors before, you've heard me say this, your diploma is fine. You might put it on your wall. You might not put it on your wall. I don't have mine on my wall, that's your choice. The transcript to me is the important thing because that is what you are providing to potential graduate or professional schools. And so showing that you've graduated with honors from your college shows that you have taken more rigorous coursework and that you've gone above and beyond. So if you complete the program, you get that on your diploma and your transcript. Are there no questions? If you have questions, you guys can always put them in the chat. You can chat me privately so everybody doesn't have to see. Okay, let's talk about the requirements to graduate with honors. So these are all the things that you must do to graduate with honors. So thing one is you have to pass three 100 to 200 level honors courses, earning a B minus or better. If you get a C in the honors, in an honors course, it does not count for honors credit. Okay, you still get the um, you still get the pillar requirement, or if you're on the old curriculum, you'll get your AOK -okay requirement, but it doesn't count for honors. So you take three of those courses, and then you have to pass honors 300 with a B minus or better. And we'll talk about what each of these mean in just a moment. Those are the only courses. Four courses, three of them count to fulfill other collegiate requirements in addition to honors. Then we have non-course requirements. So these are the things you have to do that aren't courses. You have to complete one honors enrichment unit. You have to turn in your e-portfolio each year. You have to maintain the threshold GPA and you have to attend four events per academic year or two per semester. And we'll talk about each of these individually going forward. But those are all the things that you do. If you do all of those things, then you will graduate with honors. So first we'll talk about the courses. Um, you need to take three during your time with us. They are open to only honors students. They are capped at 16 students per section. A few of them are smaller. And I'll show you the list for this semester. You'll see one of them is smaller just because of the room size. They all count to satisfy some collegiate requirement. 
Some of them satisfy major or minor requirements. The best way to find that out is by asking the faculty member who is teaching the course. That is not up to me, it's up to the department chair. So if I were to teach a chemistry honors course, the chair of the chemistry department would decide if that counted on the major or minor. So you need to, um, you'll need to ask. They are offered every semester, including January term. Now, some of you are saying, what the heck? There's no courses listed for January term for the honors program. I am working on it. I think I've got one. Um, I might have another one posted soon. Each time I add a course to the schedule for January term, I will let you all know via email because I know that there is there are a lot of people asking um, about honors courses for J term because you want to take one in January term. So I'll let you know um, if faculty members commit to teach them. And then finally, you have to earn a B minus or better in order for the course to count for honors. I already said that. Honors courses change. Hello, slide. There we go. Honors courses change every semester. So some courses we offer more than one time. Some courses are only offered once and then they go away. So it just depends on the faculty member who's teaching it, how often they're willing to teach it, et cetera, et cetera. This was our course list. I took the screenshot a couple of um, weeks ago. So these numbers aren't correct for seats open now, but these are the courses that we're offering this fall. If you are here and you're in one of Dr. Horahu's classes, she's probably mentioned to you that the pillar designations for those classes are still pending. We turned them in in June, but they're still with the committee because the committee didn't meet over the summer. So you'll find that out pretty soon. Okay, um, I will let you all know what courses are gonna be offered in the spring as soon as I have a finalized list. Um, I am still collecting courses for the spring. I had a couple get canceled. So I actually just met with the provost today. She gave me an idea as to who to ask for more. So as soon as I get that, um, final list, I will let you all know. Okay, when do you need to take your honors courses? So these are our progression standards, which you can find in the honors handbook. Um, all students should have taken at least one honors course in total by the end of the first year. They should have completed two honors courses in total by the end of the second year three courses by the end of the third year, and then they're done. Now, you can take them faster than that. There's no prohibition in taking more than one honors course per semester or more than one per year. We just want them to, people to take at least one per year because otherwise it's really hard to predict how many people are gonna, what our demand is gonna be basically. So that's why we ask you to follow our progression standards in the honors program. So one by the first year, two by the second year, three by the third year. We recommend taking them early because they satisfy collegiate requirements. And so it's a good way to get your collegiate requirements out of the way, especially for those of you who are first year students. <coughs> what you are gonna see is that when you register for courses, um, the, the courses are gonna fill pretty quickly, the ones that satisfy collegiate requirements um, because our seniors register first, then our juniors, then our sophomores, then our first year students. And so honors courses, because they're limited to a smaller number of people, tend to not fill as quickly. So they're a good opportunity for you to take them. Okay. The other course you need to take is honors 300. You only have to take it once. You can take it more than once if you want to. Um, it's taken, well, oh, this is wrong. I needed to change this after the first one. We used to require that you take it any time after the first year. I stopped that very recently. There wasn't really a reason that we were limiting it to sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And so anyone can take honors 300 at any time now. So that's a change. Um, it is a student-led service learning course where students partner with a an on or off campus partner, usually a nonprofit organization to solve a problem that the partner either ha doesn't have the time, the money, or the expertise to solve on their own. And our students spend a semester becoming 
serving as consultants, becoming experts on the problem. And then at the end of the semester, they propose real world solutions, which we give to our clients, which they often put into place. So <laughs> you need to take it once. We offer sections every semester. There's two this fall. One is taught by me. One is taught by this fall. One is taught by Dr. Rittenhouse in the math department. We are both, both of us are actually looking at um, the fate of food in our community. You probably know that our honors focus topic is the fate of food. So Dr. Rittenhouse's section is looking at the Ashland community. So things like food insecurity, food pantries, um, what is the fate of food in the Ashland community? And my section is focusing on the Randolph-Macon campus. So do we have food waste on our campus? Do we have food insecurity on our campus? Do we have, um, I think they're gonna look at um, some, some things with what's happening with catering services and what happens to the food that is given for catering services. What happens when our student athletes travel? So that's what we're looking at this semester. But these questions and problems change every semester. These are some in the past, some local organizations that we've worked with. So um, Honors 300 can be done at any time. You only have to do it one time. You do not normally know what the problem is going to be before you sign up for it. So um, you don't really get to chicken, pick and choose your problem. Occasionally, I'll know. And if it, when I know, I'll let you all know. But a lot of times these things get decided, you know, over the summer. Um, so we'll just put them on the schedule as honors 300. You'll know who the faculty member is who's teaching it, though. Okay, honors enrichment unit. You have to do one honors enrichment unit. That can be completed at any time while you're here with us. So if you're a first year student or graduating senior, you can do your honors enrichment unit. It is something that is that goes above and beyond a normal student experience. So for example, um, you could do an independent study course. So let's say you are passionate about a particular subject. I'm looking around my room here. Um, let's say you're passionate about trains. There's a train set over here to my left. Um, let's say you are passionate about trains and there's a faculty member maybe who knows something about trains, but there's no course here that, that talks about trains and you wanna do a independent study course where you learn everything there is to know about trains and write a research paper. You would partner up with a faculty member in an academic department. You would say, hey, are you willing to supervise me for this project? You would actually register for a course. You get course credit for it. And then that would also count as your honors enrichment unit. Um, most uh, academic departments and programs allow you to do an independent study course. Um, trains is not a great example because we don't have a train department here. Um, but let's say you are a sociology major and you're really interested in um, Confederate monuments, okay? You could ask to do an independent study course on that. Um, let's say you're a math major and you're interested in some famous mathematician. You could ask the chair of the math department to do an independent study course on that. He would actually love that because he's a historian. That's one way to fulfill your honors enrichment unit. You could also study abroad for a semester or a year. If you are studying abroad, that counts as your HEU. So you don't have to do anything extra other than submit it through the portal. Um, you could do an honors contract in a regular course, which means you're taking a course with a faculty member and some portion of that course you're really passionate about or interested in. So you ask your faculty member, can I do an extra project on that? I often use the example of our honors course, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, only because a really good example is, let's say you're really interested in one of the wives and you wanna do a more in-depth research project on that particular wife. You would talk to Dr. Throckmorton, who is the teacher of that course and say, hey, can I do an honors contract on, I don't know any of their names, wife number four. And she would say yes, and you would write a research paper or project. These do not have to be done in honors courses. You can do them in any course. If you have questions, you can ask me. Um, if you do a senior project in your major that is an original research project, that counts as an honors enrichment unit. 
I'm going to show you how you register these in a minute. If you do an internship, paid or unpaid, that counts as your honors enrichment unit. If you're one of our education students or our nursing students, your student teaching, which you'll do in the spring of your senior year, or your nursing clinicals, which you'll do in your senior year, count as your honors enrichment unit. If you do summer research through the SURF program, that counts as your honors enrichment unit. And then this last category is kind of a catch-all, another innovative experience as approved by the honors director. So this can be a multitude of different things. Students have come up with all sorts of creative ways, like um, organizing um, a charity drive or volunteering, or um, there's lots of different, uh, uh, um, semester at sea. Someone did a semester at the Grand Canyon. Someone did the D Disney College program. So there are many, many things that you can do to count as the honors enrichment unit. You only have to do one. Okay, and then finally, the e-portfolio. E-portfolio stands for electronic portfolio. It is like a resume, but it is a web page. So it is a web page that you create that begins in your first year. And on that web page, you can put information about yourself. And, and more importantly, you can put information about your major and put examples of the work that you do while you're a student here at Randolph-Macon. And that is gonna be different for every single person. So it could be examples of your writing. It could be if um, you are in the theater department, it could be a video or a recording of a play that you directed or were in. Could be presentations that you've made about your research. Could be artwork. It could be um, music that you've written. Um, it could be music that someone's performed, that you've performed. It can be all sorts of different kinds of things. Could be lab reports if you do, if you're in the natural sciences. Um, you post these on your website. You post information about your goals. The purpose of the ePortfolio is that it goes with you when you leave us, and you can provide it to potential graduate schools or employers after you leave us. You're going to hear me say that a lot as you progress through this program. One of the purposes of the honors program kind of that we share with the edge is to help you get where you want to go after you leave us um, and when you graduate. Okay. So the e-portfolio is something that you build onto and add every year. And at the end of the time, that website goes with you. You get to take it with you. You get to take the link. And then when you apply to graduate school, when you apply to professional school, if you're applying to a Fulbright or something like that, you have that example that you can put forward. <laughs> we do a professional development workshop at least once a year on how to do e-portfolios. We'll do one on, in the spring. It'll probably be in February or March. Mrs. Zhang in the library is the person who facilitates those. Um, if you cannot attend the workshop, you don't need to worry. On our YouTube channel, on MC Honors YouTube channel, there are tutorials from previous years. So you can watch them if you need to. But if you're able to attend the workshop, basically she has you bring your laptop with you and she walks you through the steps of making your e-portfolio. And at the end of the one hour time period, you have it almost done. So it's an easy way to get it done um, in a one hour time period, if you're able to attend that professional development. Again, if you're not, you can watch the tutorial and do the same thing. The due date is always June 1 of each academic year, right after each academic year. So it'll be due June 1st, 2023. And then, um, the handout for ePortfolio I already showed you is on our website. Okay. This next slide is currently a lie, but I hope that someday it will be the truth. I would really like to have every e-portfolio reviewed by a faculty member during the summer um, and maybe into the fall. I say that every year and then you would get feedback on it. I say that every year, I am one human and I am managing 367 honors students. So I don't have the time 
to review 367 e-portfolios over the summer because I'm managing the honors program over the summer. So hopefully um, we will eventually get more staff and we will be able to do that. So that's my goal. My goal is for to be able to give you all feedback on e-portfolios so that I can, um, so that you can get feedback every year. Maybe someday I'll meet that goal. Okay, GPA. What GPA do you need to remain in the on to earn to remain in the honors program? After your first year, you need to have earned a 3.00 cumulative GPA to remain in good standing. And then after every other year, you need to have earned a 3.25 cumulative GPA. That is, if you've been around with us for a while, we changed it last year. It used to be a little bit higher than that. And we changed it because it was not in line with what other honors programs were doing. So we wanted to remain consistent. Are there any questions? <coughs> I have talked a lot today, not just to y'all. My throat is scratchy. Okay. Um, events requirement, let's talk about events. Um, we want students to remain engaged with the program in order to graduate with honors. So we require you to attend two events per semester or four total and four total per year, not or. So we like you to spread them out, two in the fall, two in the spring. We track the events via the My Macon Web Honors Portal, which I will show you in a moment. I run, well, I'm running 15 events this semester. So you have many, many choices of events to attend. You've all chosen to attend this event. And so that counts as number one for you. So you should attend at least one um, before more before the end of the semester. You can attend as many as you want. So you could, there are some students who attend every single one of them, but you should attend at least two. Um, can you attend all four of your events in the fall? Yeah, if you wanna attend all four in the fall, that's fine with me, um, but you need to attend at least two. Okay, so what happens if you don't meet the requirements? Twice a year, <coughs> I look at every single person's honors degree audit, which I'll show you in just a moment. I do it during the January term and I do it after the spring term. When I do it in the January term, that is for honors warning status. So everybody gets a letter from me in January term. The letter says either congratulations, you are meeting all of the requirements of the honors program thus far. It looks like you're proceeding to be in good standing at the end of the year. And then attached to that letter is your honors degree audit, which I, I'll show you in just a minute. Or it says, wah, wah, it looks like you're not meeting the requirements for the honors program. Here's what you need to do to get yourself in good standing, okay? Again, attached to that is your honors degree audit. There is no consequence to that letter. You can still participate in honors. You can still live in honors housing. It's just to give you a heads up that you may not be meeting the requirements because sometimes students don't realize, okay? So you'll get that letter in the January term and it comes to you through student mail. That's the one I put in your student mailbox. Then at the end of the academic year, I do the whole thing again. So I look at everybody's file again and you get another letter from me. So it either says, again, it says, congratulations, you've met the requirements for your year, you're in good standing, and you get another copy of your audit. Or it says, you are on probation. Or it says, you are separated. Okay, so let me tell you what that means. If you are on probation, that means at the end of the academic year, you did not meet the requirements of the honors program. So whatever was in that J-term letter, you didn't fix. You will be on probation for one year during which you can fully participate in the honors program. There are no consequences in terms of what courses you can take. You can still attend events. You can still live in honors housing. You have one year to bring yourself back in good standing. 
if you don't bring yourself back in good standing in one year, then you're removed from the program. Now there is a, a procedure by which you can appeal that a proceed that is actually happening right now. Students who are in the removal phase can appeal up until this Thursday. Um, and when appealing basically means you write a letter to the Collegiate Honors Council saying how you will meet the requirements in the future. So you're on probation for a year if you don't meet the requirements at the end of that year. If you're not in good standing, you will be um, removed from the program. So how do you know what your standing is? Well, you get those two letters from me, but at any time you can go to my Macon web and see your honors degree audit, okay? Now this picture on your screen is not gonna look exactly like what you um, see because I'm a faculty member, so I don't have all the same tabs that you do. So you, you all probably don't have finances and admin and all those things, but I know it's on your student tab. So you need to go to student and honors. And then you'll be able to see your honors program audit, which is where you, you um, view your audit. You'll be able to see your enrichment unit, which is where you put in what honors enrichment unit you did. You'll be able to see your ePortfolio link, which is where you put in the link to your ePortfolio once you get that done. So if you click on your honors program audit, you're going to see something that looks like this. That is really tiny, but don't worry, I've blown it up on the next few slides. So the top of it looks just like your degree audit. It's got your name and your ID number and the name of your advisor, your GPA, blah, blah, blah. And then each section is for a different honors program requirement. So here's the section for grades. So this student, this is a fake one. I just made this one up. Um, this student has taken their three honors courses. They earned A's in all three of them. And here's the credits and there's their grade. So they have a little check here that shows that they have completed that requirement. If they haven't re completed that requirement yet, instead of the check, it's the same thing as your Randolph Macon degree at it. It's a little X, okay? Easy enough. This student has completed honors 300. So in the next section, you see honors 300, the grade that they earned, the number of credits in the year that they took it. And because they've completed that requirement, there's a little check there. The student has also entered, the student is an overachiever because we're gonna see that they're a first year student on the next slide. The student has also entered their honors experiential unit into the portal. So they've done another innovative experience as approved by the honors director. And there it is, and they have a check because they completed it. Okay, this person has not completed all their e-portfolios because you have to enter the link after every year. So you'll see there's the X, they've only entered the one for their first year. So when you complete the program, you'll have three of these links, one for after your first year, one for after your second year, one for after your third year. You don't have to do one after you graduate. Okay, and then this person has met the GPA requirement. I don't know what their GPA is, but it's higher than um, 3.0 or 325. Finally, at the bottom, you can see the person's events. So on your end, you can only see the number of events that you have attended per academic year, okay? On my end, I can see a list of all of the events that you've attended. So I can tell you which ones I've logged for you. Um, we tried putting the list of every event. It didn't make, it, it made the honors degree audit really long because some of our students will attend, you know, 10 events per semester. So we just list it like this. As long as these numbers add up to four, you're good, at least four. They can add up to 20, they can add up to 10, they can add up to five. They just had to have to add up to at least four in one academic year. <laughs> so this person did three in the fall, one in January term and one in the spring. Okay, so that is the honors portal. I encourage you to play around. Let me go back real quick. I encourage you to play around with the honors portal. Take a look at it. If you have any questions, let me know. 
you should be able to see your honors degree audit now. Your academic advisor also has access to this. So they can look at your honors degree audit as well. And like I said, you will get a copy, copy. You will get a copy every January and every summer. Okie dokie. I am almost, I am mindful of your time. It is 4.49. We're gonna finish up here shortly. A couple of, a couple of, um, announcements, just things to put on your calendar. Um, I hope that you have read the book, The Fate of Food by now. If you did not get the book, um, please make sure you email us at honors at rmc.edu and let us know. The author of the book, Amanda Little, is coming to visit us in November. She's going to be on campus for two days, a Thursday and a Friday. She's going to visit honors courses and other courses, and she's going to give a, a keynote address um, that's going to be open to the public. So please mark your calendar for the 10th and the 11th of November, because I want every to, everybody to participate in some point of her visit. In addition, <coughs> we have tons and tons and tons of events planned for the fall. This is really small, so I've blown them up on the next slides. We've already done the first two, intro to honors um, and intro to honors. So um, you can't count both of these for honors attendance credit because they were both exactly the same. Um, on the 23rd, which is I guess next, a week from Friday, we're gonna have our first honors book discussion in Andrew's multi-purpose room. On the 29th, we're gonna have a professional development on building students' cultural competence from 12 to one. And then on the 30th, if you're a first year student, um, you can come and pick up your honors t-shirt. Every first year student gets a free honors t-shirt. You can come pick up your honors t-shirt. Every honor student can come and get GGs. I always have GGs at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. It's custard for those of you who are new. It is fantastic. They're gonna be parked outside of Andrews, multi, or Andrews Hall. You can come and get your free ice cream. If you're a first year student, you can come pick up your t-shirt. In October, we'll have a professional development from study abroad in the Office of International Education. We have another book discussion. We'll have our library PD. We're gonna have a paint your own pottery night, a real one like where you fire it in the kiln. Um, we are co-sponsoring a talk on redlining in the Dalton family dining room um, on the 24th of October. And then this is kind of a cool thing. We are partnering um, with the um, music department. There's a new music faculty member. Oh, some people are saying they have to go. I hear you, go. Um, to, they're gonna do a musical performance about our book and I'm fascinated to see what it's gonna be. So I think that's gonna be pretty cool. Then in November, we have our author's visit. We have a PD about the library and then we're gonna do a food drive and food insecurity awareness week toward the end of the semester. And then on the seventh, we're gonna have our now annual gingerbread house construction party. And this year it's gonna be, we're gonna have a judge and a prize. So everybody, everybody can have a kit or every group can have a kit. You can make your gingerbread houses. We're gonna judge them and give the winner a prize, but you get to take it home with you. Okie dokie. That's what I got for you folks. Um, if you have any questions, again, you can email me at honors at rmc.edu. You can stop by the honors office. You can make an appointment with me. Like I said, I'm gonna put this on the, our YouTube, probably not today, for sure not today, but at some point soon. Um, and I think that's it. It is good to virtually see you, although I saw zero of your faces, but I see lots of names of people that I know. So hello and welcome back to those of you who are um, returning honor students and welcome to, to those of you who are new. And that is it. Have a wonderful afternoon, folks, and I will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>